Good morning, I'm Amy Willis with EconLib, and I am delighted to be here with Professor Deirdre McCloskey, author of Why Liberalism Works, among many other classics, uh, who is with us to answer some questions. Good morning, Deirdre. Hi, how are you, Deirdre? I am lovely, thank you. It's always great to see you. Um, as you know, we recently conducted a virtual reading group on Professor McCloskey's latest book, Why Liberalism Works, and we asked the participants in our group what they would like to ask Professor McCloskey in turn. So here is our first question for you. If you're game, Deirdre, we'll just go ahead. Sure. All right. I well. <laughs> we spent a great deal of time in our group uh, in, in each session, so over many hours, talking about who we perceive to be the audience of this particular book. In other words, for whom did you really write this book? You, you say explicitly that it's an appeal towards a humane liberalism, but is your intended audience more those who already believe in humane liberalism, or is it for those you hope to become humane liberals? So is it a guidebook for us or uh, an appeal to others? Well, I, I, I suppose in the end it's both, because in the course of the, the uh, of, um, of writing the book and to some degree assembling the book out of things I had written before, I, I realized the political coherence that I was, def def that I was def defending um, and, and came up with a few arguments that we who already want a free society or understand the virtues of a free society can um, can use in convincing ourselves even more completely but of course we I, I, I hope too that young people who are the only audience we can actually whose minds we actually can change will find the book um, interesting and useful uh, I, I'm not sure they will because, you know, I, I, I keep trying to write popular books and I end up with another academic book. Um, I have a book coming out this fall from Chicago with Art Carden called uh, Leave Me Alone and I'll Make You Rich. <laughs> Catchy title and I hope that, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep doing this until everyone becomes a, a a liberal. Um, you can't change older folk. I'm afraid that we adopt our political opinions at age 25, 30 at the latest, and then they tend to freeze. Uh, and it's very, very hard to change people's opinions afterwards. As you, as you know, there have been psychological studies of this very fact. And it turns out that if you argue with someone who already has a strong opinion about global warming or whatever it is, and you argue against them, that paradoxically increases the strength <laughs> of their original conviction. Because they say, oh, no, 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 that, that argument's wrong that you're making. No, I, I, no, I want to defend this. And so I, I think the way to persuade younger people and maybe a few older is more art than, than, than books like, uh, like mine, alas. <laughs> Well, we enjoyed it, I know. Um, and you have, uh, there were several people in the group who work with young people. So we shall, we shall hope uh, that that uh, has an effect. But speaking of young people, um, we also had a discussion uh, about the teaching of economics. Um, yeah. I know you've been a professor in several disciplines, um, but we noted that recently there's been a lot of discussion about the need to overhaul the way that we teach principles courses in particular, um, and that perhaps we need to focus more attention on issues like climate change, which you just mentioned, or gender equality, or income inequality, any of these, there's a laundry list of, of topics we could talk to. So if you were a czar for the day, and you could unilaterally 
mandate what's taught in Economics 101, what would be on the syllabus? One way to express it. Don't do what we do now, which is to spend a week or two at most on supply and de demand and their virtues, and then spend the rest of the course complaining about alleged deviations from supply and demand. And that, that persuades people that there's something terribly wrong with an ordinary competitive um, economy. Uh, externalities of, of, of climate change, although I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in favor of doing something about um, climate change and, and, and indeed uh, um, the, the complaints with which I also agree that we don't pay enough attention to the fact that half of the people in the world are um, female in economics, but, but then a whole litany, one after another, of deviations alleged. Those first two, and then monopoly, and uh, uh, information, then at, at a more advanced stage, and sort of an intermediate microeconomics course, uh, um, informational asymmetries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what I'd like to persuade people <clears throat> is that roughly the economy works as supply and demand, entry and exit, pursuit of profit indicates, roughly, that it's a quantitative matter, that it's, that it's how close, you know, an engineer, uh, I don't know, a, a space scientist or, or, or something, has to take account of the atmosphere when, when, the, when, when the rocket is in the atmosphere. But outside the atmosphere, it's approximately true, though there are particles in outer space too, uh, it can be ignored. So it's, it's, a, it's an engineering problem, it's a quantitative science, scientific problem. And we act as though it's obvious that monopoly is a big deal in the American economy or elsewhere. I don't believe it is, and, I, and I've spent my career, indeed, uh, I kind of see towards the end of it, that I, I've been kind of harping on this since I stopped being a socialist. <laughs> so, so that would be my su su suggestion. And the other suggestion would be that they uh, read uh, um, the books that the that the Liberty Fund um, wonderfully prints, and they should listen to Don Boudreau and others who are are clear on all these issues. Thanks. I feel like I should say the check is in the mail after that uh, after that nice comment. <laughs> we appreciate that. <laughs> Um, speaking of books uh, and your illustrious career, we've got several questions related to books. And the first one uh, is this from one of our partic participants, Benzian. Um, we'd like to hear a little bit more about how you think this latest book, Why Liberalism Works, fits into your larger bourgeois trilogy project. Um, well, how does it fit in? We'll, I'll leave it at that for now. I've got a couple other follow-up questions. It's the it's the politics of that. That's what it is. It's the implication in a way. And I only came to it, although, you know, some of the articles, some of the pieces popular and otherwise that are in, are, um, in the book came quite early. Um, there, there's a, a couple of uh, chapters that, originated in the early 1990s. Yep. So I've been implicitly thinking about the politics, but I, I, I think I discovered that liberty made the modern world. I think from a, from a strictly scientific way, and I want you to tell the, the Swedes about this so they give me a number. <laughs> The, see what I can do. Yeah. 
<laughs> I'm sure that you all in Indiana have tremendous influence. You bet. <laughs> um, the, the, there's, the, there's a, um, it, it, it's a strictly scientific finding. That is, it's not because I believe in a free society that I came to the conclusion, although it's not exactly the other way around, but there, the, the scientific evidence that free people do much better than slaves and even 50% 50 50 slaves um, is, 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 I think, very, very strong um, historically and in contemporary terms. And so it, it, seemed, it seemed to be my, my duty uh, to announce the politics to the world. It's as though a biologist had discovered a cure for AIDS or, or something. Um, she, it's her duty as a biological scientist to, to, to tell people about this. In, in other words, the, the politics is that investment or exploitation didn't cause the modern world. And since on the right are for our conservative friends and on the left our socialist friends believe one of those two very strongly and all their arguments depend on, on capital accumulation being the spring of the modern world or exploiting the third world or imperialism being the spring of the modern world. I want them to know that they're wrong <laughs> and that the spring is innovation coming from free uh, 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 people. And that, that's, I think, an important scientific finding with tremendous implications for politics. That was, that was beautifully put. We have a question about a term that you used uh, throughout that book. Um, this question is from our participant, Alice, and you use the term innovism uh, quite a bit in the book. And she wants to know to what extent, she, uh, she thinks this term, as do I, is a brilliant term, and she wonders to what extent do you see this term sort of catching on? Um, do you see that term being used in academia at all? Um, maybe into the dictionary someday? She says it's a hashtag now, which is good, <laughs> but uh, we'd like more. <laughs> I don't know anything about hashtags. As you know, I'm a computer idiot. Um, or perhaps a computer uh, a moron at best. No. Uh, the, the, um, <clears throat> what I want to do is to at least make people aware that the word capitalism encapsulates a scientific error because it suggests to people, and people say this all the time, they say, well, if it's capitalism, <laughs> then it must be that capital accumulation is what is key to the modern world. This is something, alas, that, that um, Adam Smith thought, um, and it's what uh, Marx adopted and became, and indeed, um, uh, um, so-called Samuel Sonian economists, when they do what is called growth theory in economics, they assume this, that it's some sort of accumulation, either accumulation of physical capital, or then when that doesn't work, they move over to human capital, and if that doesn't work, they move to social capital. Accumulate, 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 as Marx said, having been a Marxist in the old days, I have a certain advantage over <laughs> some of my um, friends in favor of free societies, but so so the, the 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 even if they don't adopt innovism, they're at least if they hear it and see that capitalism is 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 misleading them, and that as many economic historians, not just me, but Joe Mokir and, and, and lots of others, not, not just Joe and me, say, um, uh, it's innovation that caused the modern world, that caused us to become rich and, and free. 
are to some degree free. So let's focus, let's turn the conversation that way. I don't know if it will become the, the standard word be, because people don't want to accept this. They want it to be true that it's the rich investing if they're conservatives or the rich extracting surplus value if they're on the left. They want that to be true because it tells either a story of capitalist virtue or capitalist sin. That's how the, how the politics lines up now. And so how would those notions of virtue and sin play into the concept of innovism? It's a, it's a, it's compelling to say that they have this narrative on either end of the spectrum. Um, do we need that as part of the story? I mean, what, what's the relationship you think there? Well, we need a, what, it seems to me that in the historical cases and in recent cases like China and India with their extraordinary economic growth, that what's necessary, even sufficient for modern economic growth, is, it, is that people stop hating the innovators. Stop at end that they come to understand that innovation is not just a matter of science or high level engineering. When someone wants to open a hairdressing salon in the neighborhood, which I very much need, um, that's an entrepreneurial act. She puts her, her heart and soul into it. It's, it's, a, it's a discovery, as the Austrians say, of something that should be done. And indeed, as the old discussion in the 1920s and 30s concluded, the, the, the debate about the logic of socialism versus free societies, um, it's what an ideal central planner would in fact order. So, the innovation um, impulse requires that the surrounding society approve of it. If they hate it, as was, is indicated by the uh, fact that the word innovation up until the 19th century was a bad word, it was always used as a bad thing that was disturbing the the, the um, disturbing the, the great chain of being which made it possible for society to survive. So, um, yeah, so the, it, there has to be an ethical change, not in the entrepreneurs or the inventors themselves, because, you know, humans have always been inventive, not on the fantastic scale that happened after 1800, but you know, they invent things, often against opposition. Mm -hmm. um, it's that the opposition has to relent. And I that, enjoy the way you say that. That is an ethical change. Yeah. It's a change in how you evaluate other people and indeed how you think about your your uh, uh, self. That is a, a, an enormous project, I think, as well. So, um. well, it was very hard. To, yeah. Well, it was it, it was a project that was accomplished once. So I think we can do it again. I agree. So speaking perhaps of some of those uh, very folks, uh, we have questions about uh, Marx and Smith in particular, who you've just mentioned. So let's mm -hmm. take Marx first, um, yeah. because as you say, you have some advantage uh, over your colleagues uh, with regard to Marx. So uh, what, what we want to know is several places in the book, you say that Marx was profoundly wrong about almost everything. Yeah. Uh, yet you also say that he still ranks as the greatest social scientist of the 19th century. How can he be so great if he got so many things wrong? Well, um, Newton got the shape of the universe wrong. Um, Darwin didn't know why natural selection worked because he didn't have a theory of genes. Um, up until the 19, uh, late 1920s, astronomers didn't know 
that there were other new galaxies than ours. They thought that our galaxy was the only one that existed. Up until 1965 or so, American geologists especially denied that the continents had ever moved. So when science advances, it advances by way of the creative destruction of earlier theories. Um, Marx was wrong, but Marx was tremendously uh, insightful, asking important questions, but then alas, because of the state of economics and history, the, the academic study of history in his uh, time, he didn't get the correct answers. I mean, John Stuart Mill, one of my heroes, um, also didn't know about uh, marginalism, which was an invention uh, of, of e e economists in the 18th, in the 1870s. Had Marx had this, since, since he was a serious student of economics, though not a and in some ways, as an economist, he wasn't a major economist. He wasn't up to the standard of Smith or, or Mill, for that matter. But um, he would have done a much, he, he, he would have got right, gotten right some things that he, that he got wrong. So my, 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 my joke is that my, um, that my conservative friends hate it when I say that Marx was the greatest social scientist and my left-wing friends hate it when I say, but he got everything wrong. Why I haven't got any friends. <laughs> yeah, Deirdre, alas, I make a similar joke all the time, right? How come we're not invited to all these cocktail parties? I, you know, no one wants to talk to us, right? <laughs> That's okay. I enjoy talking to you. So uh, that's a that's a fascinating claim, though, that uh, had, uh, or at least a fascinating question to think about, too, like how uh, Marx's economics would have been different, you know, had he lived just a bit later. Um, yeah. There's a there's a lot of different ways I think we could take that. But I want to switch you over to um, our dear friend Smith for a moment, um, because you say uh, in the book, uh, why liberalism works. You advise aspiring humane liberals to start by reading Smith's two books and reading them slowly. Um, we yeah. also heard a nice story from Alice that uh, you said it would be much better if, 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 that you told her one time, it would be much better if teachers encouraged our students to write in our books. So yeah. you might want to comment on that too. But the question here is, apart from your own, of course, um, and apart from Smith's two books, what are the next three books you would uh, suggest an aspiring humane liberal tackle? Well, you and I read a lot of books, that's our job. Um, and some of them are good and some of them are not so good. Uh, let's see. Um, well, you, you know, you can sort of name the obvious suspects, Friedman, New Capitalism and Freedom. Um, Hayek doesn't write very well, that's the only trouble. He's not, not got an engaging style, but he's very important, obviously. Um, some, of the, some of the newer Austrians, like Don Boudreau or or Pete Bodke write in um, a more engaging style. Um, you know, but, but, but the problem is that engaging style can often go along with, uh, it, it, in those two cases, it does not, but a sort of uh, a craziness, as I find personally, in Ayn Rand. Um, I, I know that a lot of my friends came to the notion of a free economy and society through the fountainhead or something like that. And, and when you're 18, it seems very exciting and wonderful. I tried to read the fountainhead when I was 
45 years old and I couldn't get page, page, page 18. <laughs> she was a script writer, for God's sake. You'd think she'd be able to make a novel that an adult could, uh, could appreciate. Um, I don't know. Look, the one, read widely, I think. A, 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 a book I just read by um, a man named Grossman, who was a Soviet no, 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 novelist. His last novel was called Forever Flowing. I have it around here somewhere. I can, I can show it to you. And it, it was, he, he died in 1964, but he had been a convinced communist under uh, 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 on Stalin. He was born in 1905. And this book is a terrifying, gripping portrayal of what a society down at the level of individuals looks like if it's not free, if it's 100% not free. So, I don't know. Um, There's no snappy answer to this. I mean, <laughs> one book that, that had a great influence on me was in 1974, Nozick's Anarchy State and Utopia. I was just coming out of a kind of Marxism. I was not a very scholarly Marxist, but in, but in my day, all undergraduates uh, read a lot of Marx anyway, just as we also read a lot of Freud. Um, so I, 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 the, the, that's where most of my scholarship, so to speak, on Marx comes. But I, 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 had, I had come out of it, and then this book hit me because I had read also um, Rawls, which was the great uh, holy book of the modern American left in, 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 the, in that era. And then, uh, then Nozick answered it. By the way, he was at Harvard too long. He was in the philosophy department at Harvard and he gradually became, went back to, um, admiring the state, uh, which was a shame. That is a shame. Those are some great suggestions. Um, I am not familiar with Forever Flowing, so I've written that down and... Go get it. I'm gonna get it today. <laughs> I, it, it's, it's very good, it's short. He, he has an enormous book, uh, which is called something else, of course. But I can't remember what it's called. It's, it's over there, I can, I can see it from here. Um, and I'm going to read that too. I read this in an audio book, which was a good way to read it because it's, it's a kind of unfinished novel. Ollie, he worked on it a long time. It's kind of craggy and has lots of ups and downs, but it's all good. It's just that when you hear it, you're kind of forced to keep going. And it's a splendid book. Lovely. That might make a, another good topic for discussion. But I'm glad you, you said this. This is actually something else that we talked about in our conversation. Do you listen to a lot of audiobooks? No. I'm very glad to say that my own recent books are all audiobooks. The Trilogy, for example, mm -hmm. an audiobook which astonishes me. Um, <laughs> they proposed to have a male actor read the book. And I said, oh, no. Oh. <laughs> no, no, they got, no. They got a very, they said, oh, yeah, mm, I see what you mean. And <laughs> <laughs> they, they had a female. And, so, and she, she did an excellent job. It only takes about 80 hours to read the whole thing. <laughs> so that's what you should do, what everyone should do. 
I confess I spent more than 80 hours, uh, I think. But so uh, I asked this question in part because our group was, uh, our participants were a bit split. Some of them had in fact listened to the audio book uh, mm -hmm. version and some had not. And so we, we had interesting discussions about how that, how that experience might compare. Yeah, well, there, there's uh, the, the problem with reading a book, my eyes are failing. They aren't going to fail entirely. I'm not, not ever, I think, going to go completely blind. But it's harder and harder for me to read books. So in, uh, for novels especially, um, the flow is very important and to keep going. Whereas for nonfiction books, I always advise students, it took me a long time to learn, as a scholar, you have to read too many books to read everything cover to cover. You, you, you don't read Pride and Prejudice, you know, selectively. That would be stupid because the very purpose, yeah. experience, Jane Austen's art and her, and her, uh, and, and her characters. Um, but for my books, my ac academic books and, and uh, for everyone else's academic books, you have to be selective because you've got so many books to read. So you've got to read until you get the point and then put it down. Um, so then reading is, is better. But, but of course, the problem is that you have to, you have to, you have to keep going instead of a speaker keeping going. Yeah. Coincidentally, we have promised to do another virtual reading group on Pride and Prejudice, in fact. Uh, so we'll, we'll let you know when that's coming. We haven't, we haven't set any dates for that yet. Um, just a couple more quick questions, I think. Um, so we talked about Smith a little bit. We talked about Marx a little bit. Um, I want to go back a little bit to sort of the flavor of our of our very first question, uh, and and that's this. You you say specifically on page three that the principal goal of why liberalism works is to make the case for liberalism. So again, we talked a little bit about to whom are you are really trying to make that case, um, right. but throughout you appeal to theory and evidence to support your case. And again, you mentioned this is a scientific discovery that you know we can show what. Different, what difference it makes to be free. Um, but if we wonder if uh, this theory and evidence alone will make sort of the blinders fall from the eyes of modern liberals and nationalists. Um, mm -hmm. What else do you think needs to be done to help change the minds of whether it's university professors, politicians, other members of the clerisy, or the young readers that you aspire uh, to have reading your book? It has to be the artists. It has to be the rock, the rock musicians, um, country music, movies. Um, for example, about six, seven years ago, there was a Hollywood movie called Joy, about Joy Mangano, yeah, the inventor of this, the um, the self-squeezing mop. And it was, uh, it was a pro-innovism movie. About the same time, um, the 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 uh, a film, The Founder, about Croc, mm -hmm. and who made McDonald's what it is, had the same um, sympathetic portrayal of an entrepreneur. And we need more of that. We need a lot more of it. Um, and one can't just order it up, unfortunately. Um, the, the, in, in fact, it's an interesting failure of the, of the among many others, of the, of the, of the, Soviet Union, that it, this guy, this one I met, was actually a real author originally, and was writing books that were in praise of 
of, of Stalin, essentially. So they tried to do that and they got very bad art. Um, the, the, so so it's, it's, it's obviously not something that the government can order up. Not any government I know would want to do it. <laughs> It is an essential step that it, it's the emotional, the, that's why Ayn Rand, for all my d d disagreement with her, is on the whole a force for good because she captures the gut of an 18 year old. Um, I, see some, I see some good signs among young people. Look, you can't change the opinion of my dear colleagues in English and history. I was a professor of English and a professor of history, and I was the only liberal uh, um, among these, these fine folks. They were all basically socialists of one sort or another. Um, and they're not ever gonna change, and not that they're stupid or bad, or that they even do bad, um, uh, uh, bad scholarship, often out of this Marxoid sort of um, uh, soil comes excellent, uh, uh, excellent scholarship. But um, for example, in Brazil, now here this is this is very strange. There are hundreds of local branches of students for 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 liberty. Mm -hmm. Um, as a result of this, sort of, it, there are other causes. I'm kind of a, um, uh, what would you say? I, I, I'm kind of a hero in Brazil, of all places. I don't speak a word of Portuguese. I can say, um, obrigada, which, <laughs> which you should say to say thank you, but that's about it. Um, and so the target our target and the, the, and the artists we need to think about are, 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 are those of young people. Um, and unfortunately, in, in places like the United States, especially alarmingly in the United States, this foolishness about, well, we should try socialism um, is very powerful emotionally for young people. I argue, I think in this book, but certainly elsewhere, because I've been thinking about it, that the source of the appeal of socialism is that young people come out of come 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 out of loving families, mm -hmm. and so surprise, surprise, when they when a when a middle class kid discovers there are poor people in the world. Her impulse is to, well, let's invite them to dinner. Let's make them part of the family, the, the, the loving family. And, and as Hayek said, that, that as admirable as that is among friends or family, and I, I approve of it, these are tiny little socialist enterprises and they work just fine. It doesn't work for the great society. And it's been, you know, I don't need to, rehearse the extraordinary failures of socialism. I'm working on a long paper with um, uh, Alberto Mingardi against um, uh, um, uh, what is her name? Ariana, is that it? Ariana Mazzucato. Oh, Mariana, yeah. He writes about the entrepreneurial state. Yes. And Alberto and I are just appalled by this. And, and um, that's what we need to con contradict as kind of academics. But the way to really contradict it is to read Forever Flowing and to read um, other books and I could, um, that show that the great society doesn't work like a family. Great suggestions, great suggestions. 
Um, Deirdre, I want to thank you very much for being with us today. I so appreciate your time. It is always lovely to talk to you. Um, and as usual, I know I at least will walk away with a long list of, of more books to read. Hooray. <laughs> so that can never be a bad thing. So thank you very much. It's lovely to see you. Okay, dear. Thank you very much for your